pretty amazing, cool things happen um, in the state. Helped shepherd the nuthatch whose name I always forget. What is it? The brown-headed nuthatch, which is an amazing story that I hope you will at least touch on tonight. Um, but now she's kind of in a more of a national focus, which obviously migratory birds is it's international. Um, I met Sarah when she was a AmeriCorps uh, member working for the Missouri River Communities Network. Um, and at the time, MRCN had, they were fostering AmeriCorps workers working on stream team issues across the state with a multiple organizations statewide. One of those was also my wife, Melanie. She was in that program and a whole bunch of other people. I mean, locally, Billy Polanski, who's the director of the Columbia Center for Urban Agriculture, he was in that program. There was a lot of people that have, are now like running around making really amazing, cool stuff happen through that program. And I just wanted to mention that because Sarah said she was gonna mention it and I wanted to steal her thunder, but, um, but it's really exciting to have you be able to share some of the new work that you're doing. Um, and you know, this is building off of a program that you started working on with the Department of Conservation as well. So um, thank you so much for coming tonight. Sarah, come on up here and... So here's that. <laughs> oh my gosh, oh, now it's working. I have never had something like this on my head before, so that's kind of scary. Um, hi, everybody. How are you? Good. It's nice to see such a big crowd. That's great. Um, this has to be just the most beautiful venue I think I've ever spoken at. It's just absolutely gorgeous. Um, and this is interesting because this woman right in front is wearing a MRCN shirt, which is the, the nonprofit that I worked with that Steve just talked about is amazing. Well, it has the Manitou on it anyway, which was part of the logo of MRCN. So yes. Okay. It's part of many different logos. Anyway, yes, I'm Sarah Kendrick. I'll tell you just very briefly about myself. I'm a Missouri native. I'm from Missouri. My, um, mostly from North Missouri. Uh, my dad was a conservation agent with the Missouri Department of Conservation. He was in the law enforcement part. So we grew up doing outdoor things. Uh, but when I went to undergrad, I got an English degree and uh, a minor in Italian and a minor in history, which I was a Renaissance woman. And it means that I had no idea what to do with my life. And that's okay. If you have children who are going through school, don't know what they want to do, be kind. Um, sometimes people figure it out a little bit late in life. So I figured out that I did not want to do English. And then I went back to school. Actually, first I did AmeriCorps. Um, and so that is where I met Steve and where I met Melanie many years ago in 2007. That's the year I met my husband, Kip, in the back. I built rain barrels for the nonprofit and sold him rain barrels because he was starting a community garden. So that's not just the cutest story uh, right here in Columbia or over in Columbia. Anyway, so then I realized uh, I went back to school, take courses. I took ornithology and I was just completely hooked, unlike anything had ever hooked me before. So um, I was very excited about it and decided that's what I want to pursue. So I went back to school, worked at the same time, and it felt like 10,000 years later, I was able to look for jobs. I worked for the conservation department for nine years, um, four of which as like an outreach coordinator for wildlife division. Um, and actually, I don't think I would have gotten that job if I hadn't had an English degree. So it all just kind of came full circle because I could write and communicate a little, maybe a little bit better. I don't know. That's debatable. And then... Um, yeah, then the ornithologist position, uh, Brad Jacobs, the previous ornithologist, retired, and that was my dream job, and, and it worked out. So I was in that for five years, and then I've been in this job for the last year and a half. So um, that's just a little bit about myself. Um, Steve and Melanie are truly incredible. I've known them for a very, very long time, just two of the best people I think I've ever met. So give them a hand. Let's give them a hand. Yeah. Just doing amazing work and so steadfast in it. And it's just really inspiring to see. Um, okay. I think we should talk about what we came here to talk about, which is tracking local and migratory movements of our smallest migrants. And so you might see on the screen there a few different logos. You see 
Fish and Wildlife Service logo, who, which is who I work for now. I'm a biologist for Region 3, which is the Midwest. So eight states from Missouri to Ohio up to Minnesota. So those eight states. So I'm, I'm regional, but I'm still based here in Missouri uh, in Columbia. And you also see the MDC logo. And that's because I have to give a huge shout out to the Conservation Department, who I still love and adore. And really, they took a chance on this MODIS program uh, when I was the ornithologist there. Um, I did a lot of research, but I kind of asked them to jump into this and they trusted me with uh, funding, which is uh, so important. And I just really owe most of this big jumping off point to MDC for this MODIS project. So thank you guys for having me to talk about it. I think it's pretty pretty fun and a, a kind of a fun topic. It usually is something new and different for people. So I just put this slide up here. I'm not gonna go through all these, but just suffice to say that MODIS would not occur without all of the people on this screen in Missouri. All these people either gave money, they were part of a, a federal grant that I would I wrote when I was in the state position. And I was able to con these people into being on the grants with me and put up MODIS stations or I, well, I didn't con anybody really, but it's funnier to say that. Or they gave money to our group, like the Columbia Audubon Society, which some of those folks are repped here tonight, the Missouri Birding Society. Uh, these other Audubon chapters across the state, all of these groups from different states in the whole region, the Midwest, even international partners like Selva in Colombia in South America, all these folks have worked together on MODIS and you'll see why. So I'm gonna start from bare bones. If you don't know anything about tracking wildlife or VHF transmitters, I'm going to give you the crash course really fast. So I'm going to keep it real high level. Hopefully we can all follow along. Most people can. Um, so why do we track wildlife? And it's base, base, base level. It's pretty much to learn how an animal interacts with their surroundings. Um, we put a tracker on them to see where they're going, right? What habitats they're using, how big their territories are, how big their home range sizes are, what part of the habitat they're using most so that we can manage or create that habitat for more species so that they're because that so that they grow their populations and that we support those populations of plants or animals or or any of these areas that help support life. So it can be at a variety of ranges. We can be tracking the bird's home range size, not just bird, but mammal. You see a little um, neck collar on that fawn right there. Um, but you can look at the home range or territory size movements around a landscape, um, uh, kind of at a regional level. Or you can look at breeding demography. Say you put a tag on a prairie chicken like they've done in the past and the bird, a female, doesn't move for two or three weeks during the breeding season. Well, the bird could either be dead or it could be incubating eggs, right? And sitting on a nest. And you can determine, you can track nests and nest productivity and survival and stuff like that using tracking because if the bird isn't moving, it's on a nest, things like that. And so again, at varying scales, so all the way from the habitat to a hemispheric migration, which is what we're kind of focused on today and what we'll talk more about. It was a red-bellied woodpecker. It's a baby, but I'll cover that. I'll cover that story in a minute. I don't think I'd remove that slide, but if I did, you remind me and I'll tell you the story. So these are just the big buckets of bird tracking. So now we're moving from all animals tracking down to bird tracking. So band recovery, bird banding is when you put a lightweight aluminum band, a little ring around its lower leg or, um, yeah, just on its leg. The, the tags go elsewhere on the birds, but the bands just go on the leg. They come in varying shapes and sizes. Um, they're administered by the USGS Bird Banding Lab. So if you federally ban birds, you can only get them from one place. So they're, that you have to apply for a permit to capture and ban birds. They don't want you just going out willy-nilly and capturing any old birds you want. And the band has a unique number and uh, alphanumeric code on it that identifies that individual bird. So if the bird's ever killed or you find it or you recapture it at a banding station and you read that number, you can put it into the bird banding lab database online and you can see where it was originally tagged. So you get point A and maybe a point B on the bird if it's ever killed or were recaptured. Then there's radio telemetry, which is what MODIS works off of, which is what we're gonna talk about today. Radio telemetry is probably the longest running type of way to track animals, whether they're birds or mammals, um, less cool animals like mammals, um, or whether, but it's been work, it's been going for a really long time, but the tags have gotten lighter and lighter, but that's what MODIS works off of. It's VHF transmitters. I'll tell you more about that later. Then there's uh, satellite telemetry, which only works on our big birds, not big bird, but this is a red-tailed hawk. <laughs> satellite tags ping off of satellites in space, and they have to be big. 
and you can't put anything on a bird more than 3% of its body weight. So of course it only works for the larger birds and they get the cooler tags that tell you the exact location where the bird is because it's pinging satellites and using GPS, giving you GPS points. Then stable isotopes are really interesting and fascinating and I know very little about it other than to briefly explain it, which is that you pull a feather from a bird and looking at the hydrogen laid in the feather rachis or the main stem of it, you can compare it to a hydrogen map of the Western Hemisphere and figure out where that bird was after it bred and it laid and it grew that feather. So it's really, it's very rough, very general location, but you can get a very general, general idea of where that bird grew its feather because of the hydrogen in the feather rachis, which is just absolutely bonkers. And then geolocators, you think that's bonkers. So geolocators are crazy too. So th this is a little tag on there and Sometimes they have a little solar panel on the tag and they're very lightweight. They work with some of our lighter birds like this bobolink you see here, which is a grassland bird. They breed in North Missouri, farther up into the Midwest. And this tag records uh, day length and dark time to figure out latitude and longitude of where the bird is when it turns on and off. So you can program this tiny tag to turn on uh, during um, sunrise, sunset, and it monitors that dark time and day length to figure out where latitudinally and longitudinally the bird is. Yeah, it's crazy, but it's very rough, right? Because light time and dark time are equivalent at the equator, which is where these birds are moving towards. So again, it gives you very rough general idea of where this bird was. Also, tiny detail, you have to recapture the bird the following year to take the tag off and get the data off of it. Yeah. Exactly. No, but some people do it. And so you do it because a lot of these birds are very sight faithful, which means they come back from to where they were born to breed again. So it's fascinating. And the more we learn about migration, like MODIS, like I'm, I'm going to talk to you about tonight, a lot of them are going to the exact same place in the winter too. And it makes a lot of sense. Why would they just wander around trying to find a good location they know less about? So a lot of these birds, even our small ones, are going from point A where they were born to a site on the wintering grounds where they learn to go and then back and forth to almost the exact same locations for some of the species. But for some of these species, we still don't know a lot. And that's the point of tonight's talk. So we're trying to fill in a lot of these knowledge gaps. So I already mentioned this, you can't attach anything to a bird by federal regulations that's over 3% of a bird's body weight. And so what drives all of my questions and thoughts about tracking birds are what can we put on what bird, right? Because a lot of my charge and my work come from land birds, passerines, songbirds, very small ones, right? Uh, neotropical migrants, which means they migrate um, outside of the US, right? From Mexico down through sometimes the tip of South America. Um, and so when you're talking about an eight, nine, 10 gram songbird, you have to put something T tiny on it. And so that's driving everything. So it's always a balance between the weight of the transmitter because the weight of the transmitter means the weight of the battery. So the heavier transmitter you have, the longer lasting the battery and so forth. But it all just goes back to what your research question is and how you balance that. Because when you order one of these tags, you can tell them to give it a pulse rate, meaning it emits a signal every three seconds or 30 seconds. And you need to figure out which one of those you need for what you're trying to learn. So. I hesitate to use the word cooler, but these are way cooler tags. So Mitch Wiegman was a professor here at Mizzou. He has since moved on and he tracked greater white fronted geese, which are huge. So they get a cool tag, um, but their tag has a G, it gives you a GPS location on the bird every uh, 30 minutes. So you can track the bird during migration on these long distance movements. It also has an accelerometer built into the tag and it has algorithms to show that when the bird moves this way, it's eating. When the bird moves this way, it's flying. When the bird moves this way, it's resting. And so they can not only get location every 30 minutes on these birds, but they can look at their behavior every six minutes because it turns on every six minutes and measures that. And it's just crazy. You can't do that with some of these passerine or any of the passerine tags yet. Not yet. So these are just a few pictures of some of the MDC tracking projects um, with photos that I had access to. Um, so they tracked turkeys. Um, this is a really big tag, but they wanted it to last two or three years, right? So this bird is big enough. It could have held a really big tag that gave a satellite um, 
location, but it would have been like two, three grand a tag is how much it would have cost. But they wanted to put them out on way more turkeys, right? So it's all a balance of what you're trying to learn. So this was a bigger tag that didn't give you as much information, but they wanted it to last a long time. And then this is the red tail hawk picture we looked, oh, here's your picture of your red-bellied woodpeckers. So my uh, dear friend, Allison Cox, this is a long time ago. This was in 2009 or 10, but I went out with Allison to put tags on these baby red-bellied woodpeckers. And so red-bellied woodpeckers are cavity nesters. They excavate their own cavities in dead snags or dead trees, right? And so she wanted to learn where young red-bellied woodpeckers go to find their own territory after they leave the nest cavity. So how do you do that? Well, you need to put a tag on the bird before it leaves the nest, before it leaves the cavity. So you can't just lean a ladder up against a dead tree. That's not safe. And so she would take a huge ladder out to the woods with a bunch of ropes, and they would stand a ladder up right next to the snag and then tie the ladder off to four trees in every direction. And she would just free climb the ladder. Then she would take a big, uh, a big hole saw and she and because the cavities woodpeckers go down really far, she took a big hole saw and went, you couldn't stick your hand in the natural hole in the cavity. So she would drill a big hole, stick her hand in, grab the baby woodpeckers, put them in a little bag, lower them down to people on the ground processing them. They'd process them on a tarp so that the wood chips from their body wouldn't get in the grass and predators would find it like she thought it all through. And they process the birds, which means they put these little uh, radio tags on them, which these tags today, this is a long time ago, in terms of technology, they would be much, much lighter and probably last a lot longer now. But back then she wanted to know how they explored territories outside of their parents' territory and how long it took red-bellied woodpeckers to leave their parents' territory. And that's just unknown information. And so then she put the birds back in the cavity. She sealed the hole back shut, not the natural opening. And then she had to time this perfectly because she had to wait till like a week before they fledged on their own. And then she went out and manually walked around tracking them for weeks and weeks until they finally were fed by their parents. Some days they'd go explore to other territories for like a day and then come back to their parents at nighttime. This is really cool stuff. And then finally they would make the big move and she'd follow them and they'd stay away from their parents. This is just really cool information. So that's just some examples of tracking birds and different animals for different reasons. So these are modus tags on these tiny animals. They've put them on large dragonflies. These are actual modus tags, like what we're gonna talk about tonight, and on monarchs. So this is the game changer here, is that they're super lightweight. So the general concept of radio telemetry is that you put a tag on an animal, it emits a signal, as we've talked about, every three, five, six, 30 seconds, you saw. You can have them programmed like that when you order them. So it emits a tag on a set frequency. So in the past, I would get 20, 30 tags to put on some birds to learn their territory size. And I'd capture the birds, put the tag on, walk around with an antenna like this, which has to pick up that signal detected by the tag. And for each tag has a different frequency. So I'd put the frequency into my little receiver bag right here that she has, and I'd follow it around and listen for the beep. Okay, and as the beep gets louder, you're getting closer to it. So you just follow them around, until you point at a tree and it's beeping really loud, you point over here and it doesn't beep. So you're like, okay, the bird's right there. And then you take a point with a GPS unit. I mean, that's how all this works. It's really time intensive. And so then I would take all that data and publish it and become really rich and famous like biologists. Ah, this is the right crowd to tell that joke because some people don't laugh very hard. You guys know about the pay range then, which is, so anyway, I become very rich and famous. Um, and then if we had a different project, Kip would go out and, you know, trap and tag and follow another bird on different frequencies. Okay. So they'd all be separate projects. Um, well, because of MODIS, that's the amazing thing. So MODIS has grown out of these incredibly light tags. They're longer living batteries uh, and they're more affordable, which means you can put out more, a greater number of them rather than these two to $3,000 tags that give you a more precise location. But remember, those are not an option for us for these small, small birds. And so MODIS works off of these very lightweight tags. They emit a pulse every whatever, when you ask for. They range from 0.2 grams to whatever weight. And then the, the, the pulse I was talking about, that pulse, that signal that emits from the tag is detected by these semi-permanent sensors or MODIS stations. I'll call them MODIS stations, MODIS receivers. They're, they're detected by these antennas hooked up to a MODIS receiver. And it detects that, uh, 
pulse of that tag and it stores it right there on the computer. Okay, so you don't have to recapture the bird or anything like that. So you wait for the tagged, modus tagged birds to fly within range. And the crazy thing is they all work on the same frequency. So I just described to you how I would go out and tag birds on my frequencies. Kip would do it on his. We'd both become rich and famous separately. But MODIS works all together on the same frequency, which means I can deploy a tag in main and it flies, if it flies through this gauntlet of active MODIS receivers, which is these yellow dots, it's detected all along the route on its migration. And it's not perfect. There's a lot of gaps still to be filled, but this is just incredibly revolutionary for this type of tracking because it's never happened before. We're all doing it together. People putting up stations out west or in Maine or down in Colombia and Costa Rica, we're all doing it together. And the more stations we put up, the stronger all of our research is, which is just gives me chills. And that's what we all like about migration, right? Is that these birds, there are shared birds. One third of the birds that breed in Missouri that we might think of as our birds that we see are actually belong to the tropics. They spend up to eight months of the year in the tropics. And you can see it in some of them if you're just basing it on the color of the bird, right? You look at Orioles, tanagers. I mean, we're just borrowing those tropical birds, right? For a few months while they take advantage of our abundance of fresh growth during the, the growing season, abundance of insects. And so they can smash in there and raise their babies with enough food uh, to give to all their young, right? With this big flush of growth in the temperate season. And so we're really just borrowing them, but there's more than this now. Every time I give this presentation, which is quite often, I have to update the numbers because MODIS is growing at such an exponential rate. Last time I gave this, it was for the Sierra Club maybe a month ago, and there's 300 more MODIS receivers in the world than there was. I mean, it's crazy, you guys. It's crazy how fast it's going. So this is my footless Swainson's thrush. I've, I've used this image since 2018. You would think I would update it by now, but it's just too funny at this point for me personally. So this is a Swainson's thrush with no feet drawn by David Allen Sibley, very famous uh, bird artist. This is not to scale. This is not how big the tag is. So this is its silhouette here, right here. This is a MODIS station to the antenna. It's about 15 kilometer, nine to 10 mile range. If you have a perfect line of sight and if your antennas are up high and no buildings, trees, anything like that. And here's our bird. Oh, it's flying within range. Oh my gosh, it was detected. You can tell because it went to our lap, our desktop computer right here. And so, so this is how it works in general, right? It's really ugly representation, but it helps give you the idea. Here's another ugly representation of our Swainson's thrush with no feet with its tag on. But say I tagged it in New York, it's flying within range of all these stations and it gets detected at multiple spots along its migratory route. And it gives you a lot of information about migration timing, it gives you generalities on routes, the routes that it's taking. And so MODIS is just growing so fast. And so again, I took a screenshot from MODIS by the numbers, which is their ticker on the website. And every time I give the talk, I gotta take a new screenshot because it's just growing all the time. But there are MODIS stations in 34 countries. There's 1,792 of them, 327 species tagged, 41,800 animals tagged, uh, 664 projects, 1,900 partners, 200 publications using MODIS. And so it's it's worked it's worked on birds. They're using it on bats. They're using it on large insects. And really, again, it's working off those nano tags and the array of semi permanent sensors. And it's on the same frequency. Also, all the data is open source in the spirit of collaboration. So it doesn't mean I can go on and steal Kip's Modus data and then publish it without his knowledge or anything. Whoever owns the tags has certain sign in privileges to see certain information. But you can go on the website and click on any of those yellow dots you saw on that map before, which was just a screenshot from the MODIS website, which is MOTUS.org. You could spend a lot of time clicking around on this thing, <laughs> just warning you. You can't read this at all. But what happens is when you click on one of these yellow dots, it shows you information about that station. Each of these is a MODIS station. And this one right here says tags detected, and it'll tell you the number of birds or animals that have been tagged or detected at that station flying past. And so you, it's a, you can look at it as a table. So you click table, and then it literally brings up the names of the species, the individual tags that were detected at that station. And then you can click on any of these individuals and look at a map to see where else they were detected across the entire hemisphere if they were detected elsewhere, which is really cool. So what do these stations look like? They can be pop-up masts with antennas on the top. 
Um, this is what a lot of us probably think of when we think of uh, Modus Station or Modus Tower. I've been trying to stop since the beginning. I've been trying to stop saying Modus Tower because people think like a huge cell tower and it, you can put it up very easily and very short, like 30, 30 feet, 35 feet. But oftentimes they're attached to existing buildings infrastructure. You see one on a house here. Um, these need solar panels. Otherwise, you put them on buildings and you can just plug them into a wall outlet. And they use about as much energy as a light bulb throughout the whole year. So it's very, it's relatively cheap. All of ours here in Missouri look like this because I wanted to put up more MOTA stations really fast. So the way to do that was to work with our IT people at MDC and locate all of our MDC communications towers across the state because they were already engineered, they're already up, it's already at a high point in the landscape. And so that's what we did. Um, we just tried to um, locate the ones that were in the arrays that we wanted. And then we hired the tower climber that we had on contract, went out, put up the antennas, you could see them up here. And then we, they run that coax cable down. Really all a station is our antennas, coax cable that runs down one from each antenna and it hooks onto a receiver, which is like a mini computer that's literally like this big in like a weatherproof case. That's all a MOTA station is. And so, so how, that's all well and good. That's great, Sarah, but what does this actually mean for conservation? And so we still know very little about migration of our smallest birds, where they're going. And I don't know if you've looked at the news since 2019, um, <clears throat> but many of our birds are in real trouble. We've lost about 3 billion birds or 29% of North American birds since 1970. So in the, like soak that in, in the last 50 years, we've lost up to a third of North American birds. And uh, that's really, um, it's really sad. Um, and so we really need to work together now and figure out what the heck is going on with these birds. A lot of these migrants, um, <clears throat> we haven't figured out the pinch point, the survival pinch point that's really causing a lot of these declines. Is it while they're on breeding territory? Is it while they're migrating? Is it while they're on the wintering grounds because of habitat removal? Is it because of habitat removal up here? Is it because of pesticides, uh, food loss? Um, lots of different threats. I mean, it's a tough world out there for birds. Uh, there's just lots of human-made threats and then lots of natural threats as well. Whoa. And so if we can learn about migration timing, how long it takes them to get to where they're going, where they're stopping over, you know, a lot of these birds, we, at least in my mind, I used to think that if a cerulean warbler, oh, thanks. Yeah, that'd be great. If a cerulean warbler migrated down to, through Costa Rica and to the Andes and Colombia, I used to think, while deforestation is terrible, it, it needs those patches of forest to see from up high to go down and just eat in any tree it finds. Well, the more we're learning using partially with MODIS, that's not the case at all. They're only using a certain band of elevation along these mountains, um, not even just any old forest. It's just this band and they're only using certain trees. And so it's just like, oh my gosh. So, but the more we learn about that, about our species that are declining really, really rapidly, we can do what? We can target those exact actions to help that species and do really targeted direct recovery of some of these species. But then we can extrapolate that out to habitats to help more species than just that species, at like an umbrella species, right? We can help more than just that one. And so also finding where they're overwintering, we can work with NGOs. There are lots of conservation NGOs on the wintering grounds all the way from Mexico. Um, uh, down through the Caribbean, Central America, and South America that need help and they need funds and they need our partnership. So that's been really fun to work with a lot of folks down there. But the point is all of this can target conservation work. How long have I been talking, do you think? Okay. Because there's a lot more, but I can go faster. Whew. Okay. So this is just a little bit of research from 2017. This is not my research. This is from Birds Canada, which is the group that manages MODIS. They're up in Ontario. Um, of course, it's a Canadian company helping everyone in a collaborative spirit of togetherness. This is just so beautiful. I love it. Um, and so Birds Canada started MODIS. Um, and these white dots, on this is Ontario, and these white dots are all their MODIS stations. So of course they have this like beautiful net of MODIS stations so they can do a lot of local tracking as well. So I haven't mentioned that too much, but in addition to long, long distance tracking, we can also do local tracking, which shows you things like this, if it would play. But this shows you uh, birds were 
were tagged here, of course. And then as they leave on migration, you can see the, the dots moving. Each different colored dot is a different bird that's tracked using MODIS. And while we don't know that they're moving this exact line, these are subsequent points at these MODIS stations. So it's showing you a lot of variation in the speed that they're going. And it, but they're all generally taking the same corridor, aren't they? Which is really interesting because at like a regional scale all across Ontario, you can see that this patch of forest along the edge is really important because that's where all the birds are moving through. And that's funny, isn't it? You'd think that they would just shoot across and just try and get from point A to point B the fastest way possible. And with more and more birds we're learning about, they're not just going the fastest way from point A to point B. They need to fold in stops in between, right? To refuel, they're going a really long way. And really it's just the strongest or fattest birds that can go from point A to point B really fast, but that those are kind of outliers. They need those little stops in between connecting the wintering grounds and the breeding grounds. And so this was one of the first big modus studies out of Colombia. This is my friend Camila Gomez, who tagged about 133 great cheeked thrushes in the Santa Marta mountains of Colombia down here. And the birds stayed in the Santa Marta mountains. These are not birds that overwintered in the Santa Marta mountains. They just came there, were tagged there. And she found that they stayed for up to two weeks at this spot from other locations because this stopover site is so important because there's an abundance of berries and fruit in this area that thrushes especially like to eat. Um, so they gorge and just get real fat before they make these huge movements over the Caribbean and up all the way to Hudson Bay sometimes. So. She found that birds who didn't take up to 30 days to sit there and gorge and eat lots of berries took 30 days longer to migrate. Like that's a whole month. That's really big deal. And then one individual flew 3,200 kilometers in three days. No doubt a fatty, one who gorged on lots of berries who could go real fast and farther, but didn't have to stop for that break, right? And then another flew about 2,000 miles, just, you know, two weeks onto the Hudson Bay. It's just really incredible what we can learn about these really tiny birds. I mean, they're really only 40, 50 grams. It's quite, it's wild. This is just a picture of the Santa Marta Mountains where they tag the birds. It's just really beautiful. If you ever get a chance to travel to Central America or South America, mm, it's the best. It's the best. Whoa, this? No, that's the throat. That's the uh, orangish throat of a Swainson's thrush in flight. But it's covered up, like here. Yeah, it's hard to see. And so this is just an animation of that tracking. So these are Swainson's thrushes in orange and then gray cheeked thrushes in gray. You'll see pop up here in a minute. And look how few modus stations there were. This is from 2017. So think about what those tracks would have looked like if we'd had all those modus stations in there. But this was one of the first big, cool modus projects that even with this few towers, look at all the cool detections they got because they were flying over all these stations, right? We're way more powerful if we have more stations. We can do so much more if we have more stations. Um, so yeah, this was just data. Every time you handle a bird and put a tag on it, you look at body condition metrics, like how fat the bird is. There's like fat scores to see how fat they are. When you have them in the hand, you can blow on them and the feathers push back and you can see their skin. And you can see the fat deposits in the furcula right here or around the um, abdomen region. Um, but you can see the fat through their skin. It's really cool. So you can give them a fat score. Um, and so she found that the fatter birds went farther faster, right? Because they had more fuel to work off of. So these are just animations of birds, Swainson's thrushes, similar to great cheek thrushes that we just talked about. These are birds at five locations that were tagged post breeding in Canada. These are their tracks. And then these are Camila's tracks that I just showed you. Um, from the other side. So when we do these projects that tag birds on both ends, we can really learn like where they're going and what that variation is like and how to target uh, conservation for them. I'm gonna skip this just for in the, just to save some time. So I help coordinate MODIS station placement and MODIS in general at the regional scale. Um, when I was a state person, I still did this because I was excited about MODIS and they're like, hey, you should be the, you know how it is, you know, you get excited about something and they're like, hey, you want to lead something? And you're like, yeah, I totally do. Um, so it's the, it's called the Midwest Migration Network. It's across region three, the Midwest region that I work for now. And really we just help act as a point of contact for the Midwest if people are interested in MODIS or want to put up a station there, where do I put it? And so it's a, I have a lot of MODIS conversations. 
And so we have worked across the years to increase modus across the Midwest, but also in the neotropics, which is key, right? Because that's where we're tracking the birds to go to and from. And so this is kind of our pie in the sky. The yellow dots are active stations. The orange ones are the ones we want. And you can see that they're laid out in latitudinal arrays for north south migrants and also along our major rivers. Look, I made a tie to rivers. Can you believe that? Um, but no doubt, birds use large landmarks like rivers uh, and many other things that I don't think we fully understand at all um, to navigate during migration. But our goal after latitudinal arrays or at the same time as latitudinal arrays is to put more stations along our major rivers and along our Great Lakes. Because again, big migratory corridors, and so I am this red star right here, but there's different modus coordinators that just add this work into their normal jobs because we think it's really cool. So our goal always, when I worked for MDC, we pitched this in like 2017 or 18 to put up two latitudinal arrays in Missouri across the north and across the south because our southern Missouri is Ozarks and our northern Missouri is grassland. And we wanted to look at that variation and maybe detect birds as they move from the south to the north. So this was the MODIS map in 2018. So I went around all these Audubon chapters. Will you give us some money so we can put up MODIS state? That's how I talked back then. Um, it's been a long five years. But yeah, so back then I would say, hey, guys, look, there's a black hole for MODIS. There's nothing there. This is five years later. No, I talk like this. This is five years later. Can you believe this? Like, look at this. Like, that's crazy. And that's, of course, well, yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome. It's it's cool across the whole country. I hope you're not clapping for me. This like this teeny weeny spot I'm responsible for, but like this is crazy. This is a ton of time and effort from all these people. And there's so many more gaps, right? There's so many, so much more we can do, but it's really grown. And so when I worked uh, for the conservation department, I could apply for a lot of federal grants that I can no longer apply for now since I am the grantee agency, right? And so we would fold in stations down in Central America, too, to put more up there. And so we were responsible, me and other Midwestern states who put in for these grants, 15 new stations across the Neotropics. So this is Mexico, down through Central America and Colombia. So that was exciting. Um, these are those, I guess, that you can't see very well. So we need a lot more down there as well. We need a lot more support. And it really started getting detections on these MODIS stations in Missouri right away, which was just the most, what's the word? Gratifying thing. After working so hard to put up these stations, and then we got detections right away. So we put together these little MODIS reports that were just high level to tell people what birds were being detected to be like, hey, keep giving us money so we can put up more because it could be cooler. So between 2018 and 2021 in three years, I think I have two slides of this. Nope. Okay. Um, we had 300. No, this is wrong. From 2018 to now, we've had 317 detections of birds tagged really across the hemisphere. Uh, 180 tagged animals, 24 species of birds and one bat, 25 projects. And this, and in, in the first three years, we had 101 detections from 2018 to 2021. In 2022 alone, we had 140. And so there's so many more modus tagged animals out there on the landscape to be detected. So this is just one of those tracks. This is a Swainson's thrush. It was detected on three stations in Missouri, but it was tagged originally on its breeding grounds um, up here in Vancouver. This is fall 2021. Um, as it migrates south, this is spring 2022. Look how it's detected on all these stations, including Missouri's. And then fall 2022. So they got like three migratory tracks because that bird's big enough to hold a tag that lasts that long. This is a whippoorwill that was tagged in Ontario in July, detected in Missouri on three stations in a row going south. And then it was detected in Veracruz, Mexico, very close to where they overwinter in September. And so while this isn't telling us the exact route, the exact like daily mi like minute detections of these birds, it's telling us a lot about where they're going and how we can make those connections between the wintering grounds um, and the breeding grounds. If you're interested in reading more about this, these reports are very high level, but if you just Google MDC MODIS progress, um, they'll pop up, but they're just kind of fun to read. They have maps like this that show, these are the red dots are all the locations where the birds that were detected in Missouri, this is where they were originally tagged. So it shows you birds were tagged all over, uh, you know, up in Canada, the US, 
even down through South America. And then the, they were later detected in Missouri, which is kind of cool. And then these, these yellow circles are bigger by the number of detections at each station. So it just shows you which stations are more and less popular or busy um, in migratory pathways. And there's really equal representation between the Ozarks and grasslands, which is really cool. Um, yeah, so I'll just tell you a little bit about some of the research we've done. How much time do I have left? As well, you know, don't say that. State, whoa. Everybody in the room's like, shut up, Steve, don't say that. Okay, okay, well, I'll just give just a little more. Okay, okay, so these are just a few projects that I've worked on with international partners, which is my favorite thing to work on. So my, my role now as a migratory bird biologist, I get to continue this full annual cycle conservation work. And what that means is that we work to curb threats for our migratory birds across their full annual cycle, meaning not just when they're here breeding, but also working with partners during migration, during stopovers, during overwintering, because again, they face th threats throughout that whole cycle. And if we're not doing everything we can across this full annual cycle, I feel like we're really failing. Um, so we try to do what we can uh, within our constraints with these partners. And so when I still worked for MDC, I got to go to Costa Rica to tag um, golden wing warblers and wood thrush with these modus tags. And our idea there was that, well, we get to go someplace cool, but also that we would tag birds while they're on the wintering grounds pre-spring migration because we have more modus stations up here. So that as the birds migrated north, they'd fly within range of more stations and hopefully we would increase the probability of getting detections on modus stations. So this is Ernesto Carmen. He was not in this picture. I don't know if you could tell by my amazing Photoshop skills of this square around his head, but luckily he was standing in front of jungle in that picture too. So he really, and I put this gray piece right here so that you'd think he was standing there. But this is Ernesto. This is Pazirola. This is Nick Bailey. Nick is from Colombia. He's a Brit, um, but he moved to Colombia a long time ago. It's been doing bird research since he was like 11 years old. He married Camila Gomez, who did the modus work on the thrushes before. And so um, they're an incredible couple, just do so much with their NGO, which is called Selva, which I've mentioned before. And Ernesto and Paz are now part of Selva as well. Selva is a really cool NGO that is now empowering it's training, it, they've trained over 100 biologists across Central America by having these workshops to really try and grow capacity across Central America. It's so cool because that is so necessary. We can't depend on two people in Costa Rica to travel around to four countries to place modus stations, which is what they've been doing. They've been doing that. And we need to grow capacity across all these countries to do this work um, and more work. And so Nick just busts his buns to try and uh, train a lot of people, grow capacity and do a lot of conservation work. So uh, one of the grants that we got, whoa, whoa, uh, when I worked for the conservation department was a big federal grant that placed 60 new modus stations across eight Midwestern states, and then Costa Rica, uh, the Yucatan, and Colombia. So we got to work with these folks, and it also supported three tagging projects, um, one of which was to tag 25 golden wing warblers, which you see here, and then 25 wood thrush, again, down in Costa Rica. Um, so this is just a picture of the golden wing warbler with a tag on its back. They're very tiny. You can see the antenna sticking down a little bit. And then these are just our beautiful birds with modus tags on. I'm sure most of you have heard of wood thrush before. Yeah, they're an eastern, eastern deciduous forest breeding bird. I'll talk a little bit more about them later. So this was something really cool that happened. So I don't know if you ever had the opportunity to meet Brad Jacobs. He was our previous state ornithologist with the conservation department. And I followed him up, which are not easy shoes to fill if you ever knew Brad. Um, he was just one of the most inspirational people, just no ego, which in the birding world can sometimes be very rare. Uh, if you've birded before, um, I love my birders. Um, but Brad was just a very, very special person. It's really hard to articulate how uh, selfless he was and just an amazing educator. And he was a huge proponent of full annual cycle conservation for migratory birds. He pretty much um, thought up a program that is now a real thing um, called Southern Wings, where state agencies can help support habitat management um, on the wintering grounds and on stopover sites. And Dave, I believe you were, were you instrumental in helping to get that started at the conservation department. So thank you to you. But Dave worked with Brad to get this idea. And it was, it was really kind of Brad's vision uh, to support these projects beyond our borders, right? 
So he had traveled a lot and learned a lot about this. So he was kind of, he was definitely my mentor. He was a very good friend. He passed away in May, 2020, uh, during the pandemic, kind of uh, unexpectedly. And so the Columbia Audubon Society, who's repped here today, thank you, donated funds to place a MODIS station in his honor in Columbia, in downtown Columbia, the Waters Moss ah, Conservation or that area in downtown off of old 63. So they placed the station, we put up a plaque that said donated in memory of Brad Jacobs. And I was down doing brown headed nuthatch surveys in the Ozarks. And I get a text from Jim Gast, who was the president of Columbia Audubon Society. And he said, we just got our first modus detection on the Columbia station. Like he was checking it every day. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. And he said, it's a golden, it's a golden wing warbler. And I was like, no way. So this was the spring after we went down there to tag golden wings. And I was just like, oh, it's like going on the modus website, trying to figure out like if it was one of our birds. And it was that bird I took a picture of. Like, that's crazy. And it was the first bird detected on this station in honor of Brad Jacobs, who was like the full annual cycle guru. It's just crazy. Isn't that crazy? It's just crazy. And, and so I just couldn't believe that. It was Brad in bird form, I'm pretty sure. Um, and I think he would be great with me saying that. Um, but another thing about it is the week before I had seen this bird detected on our southern southern station in the Ozarks, which means that we got to show a week long stopover in Missouri. So we're also providing that stopover habitat. So I just thought that was absolutely crazy. Um, and this is why people keep doing MODIS is because of these anecdotal stories of these really crazy long distances these birds travel. So this is just a slow-mo release video that we have to take of golden wing warblers flying off with the tag. This is in a patch of vanilla that they were growing in the coffee farm um, where we tagged birds. So if you don't know about bird-friendly coffee or shade-grown coffee, that is a totally different talk that I'll come back and talk about later in life. But um, do your research and look up bird-friendly shade-grown coffee because the types of coffee we're spending money on are not supporting habitat for our birds when they're down south. And it, is, it makes a huge difference. And it's so important. It costs a little bit more, but it's so important. I'm going to stop because I'll talk about it forever. So this is another release video of a wood thrush. We also tagged them. They're so pretty. Yeah, on the wood thrush, because they're bigger, they'll last over a year. So we'll be able to get a northward movement and a, a southerly movement the following season, which these pilot efforts of these 25 birds of each species are both leading to bigger efforts. So this last spring, I really had to twist some arms to take some people to Costa Rica. But in my current role, um, we wanted to do more. So we tagged 25 golden wings. Well, now we wanted to tag 50. So I got a little grant within Fish and Wildlife Service that paid for the tags and paid for my travel. And then I just convinced all these other people to go um, because it's a cool project. Also, we'd all worked together for the last five or six years over Zoom. And a lot of these partners hadn't even met each other in real life. So it was just an incredible opportunity. So this is Nick Bailey with Selva. This is Rhonda Smith. She used to build the previous version of MODIS stations, MODIS receivers. She's married to Adam Smith, who's the new US MODIS coordinator. So we got him to come down to. This is Stu McKenzie. He's the head of MODIS at Birds Canada. So I got all the big wigs to come with me. This is Julie Caicedo. She's Colombian and works for Selva. So she came over to, this is my supervisor, Andy Forbes. Remember Andy Forbes? He used to work for the conservation department. Now he's my supervisor. <laughs> he lives up in Minnesota. This is Mike Wells. He's a biologist with me. This is Pazarola and Ernesto Carmen, the folks you saw on a previous slide in Costa Rica. They did all the field site scouting and everything on the ground with us. And then that's me. And so we got this big group of people. We would walk around habitat that Paz and Ernesto had scouted. And literally, we just walk around playing a golden wing warbler song. And we just hike around with our net poles and all the stuff we needed and just playing the, the song and chip, chip noises. And then if we'd hear a chip, we'd stop and we'd make sure it was a male or female, make sure it was a golden wing warbler. And then we're carrying around our poles. So we just put up a net. Um, you can see the bamboo poles and the metal poles, but we just put up a net and then play the song, try to capture the bird. And then we put on modus tags. So this is this is a bird in the in the in the bag. This is Julie. Julie and I, I hardly speak Spanish and she hardly speaks English. So it was really hilarious, but we had our own language down the entire like four days we were together. Like we just limped over it and it was just amazing. Um, so these are just pictures of us processing the birds. This is how we weigh them in a film canister. 
Um, we take wing measurements. And this is Nick blowing back the feathers. You can see they're black on the inside, these feathers. And he could look at the fat. And then these are just the figure eight harnesses that we put these tags on like a backpack. They go up around the drumsticks of the bird's legs down here and they sit on their back like a backpack. So these little pieces of elastic go around their legs and it's really hard to get them up under the legs without hurting them. So you need the training, right, to do this. But this is what the tag looks like. And then we put it on the bird. This is Ernesto and Julie. This is Julie working the harness up around its legs. It takes a few minutes, but they get really, really fast with it. Um, these are just more beautiful pictures of golden wing warblers, which are just one of the most beautiful. Um, it took us about three hours, Ernesto just driving around after we'd tagged the birds all morning. And then they'd look around in the afternoon and be like, you know, that house would be a really good one because if we put up a motor station and pointed the antenna right there, we tagged all the birds on that mountainside. And then they just like cold call, walk up to the house, knock on the door, and they just convince them to put a motor station on their house like this. Like that would never work here. But the Costa Rican people are very warm and wonderful and trusting. Um, so Ernesto would just walk over to a huge bamboo patch. They all have a machete. So you just walk up, shing, shing, and then shing off the, the leaves. And then you just had a pole to put up a motor station. Just so, life is so much easier there in every respect, <laughs> even with motor stations. So then we all worked together and put up motor stations. It was very nice. Here's one of our release videos again. Um, and of course, the most enriching part is working with international partners, of course, um, because we have shared birds. We're working on the same birds, but at different sides of their lives. It's just pretty incredible. Here's more, more release videos. They're in slow-mo, of course, because that's the, I really should have trimmed this one down. It's building suspense off into the jungle. But isn't it cool to see these birds that breed where we are in these jungle habitats? It's just so cool. Oh God, there's another one. It's okay, we'll skip this one. And so the other 25 wood thrush that we tagged, that's also leading to a even bigger project that I get to coordinate now and I'm so excited about it. So these, these are eight tracks from those 25 wood thrush we tagged. This is just eight tracks, but look how good the tracks are. It's almost half, right? It's almost half of those tracks. Not really, but Eight out of 25 ain't bad, okay? And the green lines, these are the spring migration north, and we got about three tracks of them the following fall on migration. So we need more of these, which made us think we need a stronger harness, right? Maybe the tags fell off, things like that. So we've, we're adapting. But we thought, I was looking at this and I'm like, well, we kind of showed really general migratory connectivity, which means tying breeding populations to wintering populations. Because they, they tag these birds in Costa Rica and Nicaragua. Clearly, these birds are breeding in the northeast, right? They're all going right there. And these birds breed across this entire eastern U.S. So I'm like, hmm, if we deploy tags across the entire wintering range, I wonder what arrows we would see there, like how they're tied together to across the wintering range. And so I'm coordinating this range-wide project across the entire wood thrush breeding range because that'd be fun because we thought, Okay, if the birds that we tagged, which I just talked about, go to the northeast, what if we tagged them across the wintering range? Like, where would they go? Would it match up east-west? Like, what more can we learn? And then I thought, well, let's just tag birds across the breeding range, too, and then see where they go. And then we can have birds tagged on both ends, and that could be really cool. But we need a lot of people to agree to do it. And so... Um, I've presented to two flyways, the Atlantic Flyway, which is all the states over here, and then the Mississippi Flyway, which is all the states working together over here with federal agencies and stuff like that. And I pitched it to them. And really, I just challenged states to buy 25 modus tags for their state and then find someone in their state to deploy the tags, trap wood thrush in their state, and deploy the tags. And people are actually doing it. It's really... <laughs> It's really exciting. So I have 18 states across the breeding range signed up to do this. It's like 450 tags. And Selva is going to coordinate all the wintering grounds tagging. And they got a grant to do that. So they're going to deploy 140 tags across six countries in the wintering range in winter 24-25. And then we'll tag like 450, maybe more, birds across that entire breeding range next summer. And so we'll have two years of data or a year's worth of data per bird, and we'll be tagging them from like both sides. It's going to be really cool. So maybe in the future, I can come update you on that. But um, thank you guys for your attention. I know it was really long. I apologize, but thanks for your attention. I appreciate it.
questions? Oh, we got a question right there. Don't forget to smooch the microphone. Okay, I have two questions. Okay. One, um, are the stations telemetered? So is the information immediate or is or do you have to like download it and upload it? So it depends on the type of modus receiver you have. So the old school ones, um, they keep the data on the re receiver, on the like mini computer and they're cheaper, but um, it, it was impossible. We have 36, 39 modus stations in the state now. And so we just can't drive around. It would take like weeks. Um, and so the old school ones, yes, hold the data on site and you have to go download the data off of it like three, four times a year. The new ones that nearly all of our Missouri stations are, are sensor stations, which they transmit the data, any data they get on the cell network. And so we pay like a small data transfer fee per station based on how much data is downloaded on that station. Um, and then yes, immediately the data is transmitted. And I think it takes like a few hours for it to upload on the website. So it's pretty... It's pretty real time, unless you have that lag. So after every migration, you have to wait for people to go visit their stations and upload the data if they have the old type of receiver. Cool. Um, and then what does the station cost? Oh, great question. I always forget <laughs> to say that. So it varies. No answer to a modus question is ever an easy answer. So uh, the stations that we put on the antennas or on the towers we already have are about 3,500, 4,000 which sounds like a lot, but in the grand scheme, it's really not, it's, it's pretty affordable, uh, especially to put them up in mass. Mm -hmm. If you put up a pop-up station uh, with inflation things, you know, uh, especially during the pandemic, I had to wait a year and a half to get antennas because we had to source things like antennas. Um, so we had to wait a long time. Um, but if you're doing a pop-up station with solar, it can be as much as like eight, $10,000, but it just depends on where you source your materials from. But if you're just, all you need is like a metal mast and a bracket to put it on any high point. So you can cut corners and make it very cheap. Um, some folks up in Illinois build their own antennas if you have the know-how to do that. So it can range from about 3,500, 4,000 to sometimes 10 or 12,000, but that's really high. And if you put them in the neotropics, they can source the materials for way cheaper. So you can put stations down there for half of that. Okay, we have a question over here. Yeah. Um, I was just curious, are you noticing northward rain shifts uh, possibly due to climate warming? Definitely due to climate warming. Yes, we have. Um, so uh, the National Audubon Society has a really good tool online. It's, um, I think it's called the climate map. If you just Google Audubon climate map, they have a really interesting map with hundreds of species on it that you can click through, not just under one climate scenario, but under about three, one with like no change a little bit incremental increase in temp and then like the projected higher ones. And it shows you what the ranges are protected or predicted to change to. So that's really staggering because yeah, as many of you probably know, it'd be putting birds into areas that they don't have enough time to adapt to in the long run. And so, yeah, it can be, I mean, we're seeing it with Mississippi kites. We're seeing it with black vultures. We're seeing it with a lot of species that are moving real fast, like in the last five, six, seven years. So yes, definitely impacts with rain shifts. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, as you know, you know, a lot of disease comes from migratory birds and can infect like domestic flocks. Mm -hmm. So do you work with USDA, APHIS, veterinarians, epidemiologists kind of help put those pieces of the puzzle together to kind of track where that disease may have came from, you know, such as like avian influenza. We had a yeah. really bad outbreak last year. So yes. Yeah, there are lots of folks within the Fish and Wildlife Service who focus on disease like that, especially, and folks at APHIS who study that exact thing. I do not study that, so I really can't speak to it, um, other than I've seen some presentations from APHIS folks in the last, you know, six months that are trying to update and project, like, what this will be like as birds are moving back north and south on spring and fall migrations, but I really can't speak to it with any smarts, just because... Uh, the study of disease is just like a whole nother realm that I have not studied closely, but it is very interesting to see, um, yeah, the time frames and how it just shuts off right after migration in some ways and what they're doing to try to combat it. Yeah, but I, I apologize. I don't have a better answer for that, but there are a lot of people working on that. <laughs> very hard. Here's another question. Yeah. Um, what the range wide project is the, um, do you know the genomics? I mean, is 
their separate population mm -hmm. or, or do you plan on doing genomic research on that we don't plan on doing genomics just because that's a whole different skill set than just handling the birds even putting tags on is a way different skill set than most people have you can find a lot of people who know how to ban birds because they handle a banding station or it's just an older form of uh of tracking birds right so more people have that skill set and it's also easier to teach how to hold a bird i mean it's still hard but how to safely hold a bird, take it out of a net, put the band on, but it's a whole nother ball game to try and put those little tiny figure eight harnesses on them up and around their legs without like stretching their legs and hurting them. So genomics are a whole different thing. Uh, we could try to do stable isotopes by pulling some of the feathers. I think that would be less intrusive and anybody could pull a few feathers, right? But then you'd have to wait so long on those results. And, and for the range wide project, we wanna trap them on breeding territories because I want that direct connection between breeding I don't want to wait till August and capture passage birds that are already migrating. I want to really try and be as tight as we can to make that connection between breeding and wintering, but like bleeding birds to look at DNA and stuff like that. Uh, I've never done that. And it's just an even smaller skill set to try and find folks to, to bleed birds safely where they don't lose too much blood. And Wow. Yeah. Okay. I have a question. Melanie. I, or I have questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know there's a lot to cover, but it seems like I've been hearing a lot lately about light pollution mm -hmm. and what people can do to sort of help the migration happening. Mm -hmm. And then I was, I was really happy to see this slide about, um, whippoorwills. Cause I was like, do whippoorwills even migrate? Mm -hmm. They're such a weird bird and, yeah. and what's going on with whippoorwills. And it seems like, yeah, major decline. Yeah. People talk about it, you know, about hearing them and not hearing them anymore. So yeah. I, those are my two thoughts. Questions. There's a lot to unpack there. You asked the wrong <laughs> long-winded person. I'm just kidding. Uh, yes, light pollution is a major a major issue and they're finding some cool stuff with whippoorwills tagging them up in Canada. I think they're using GPS tags that you have to recapture the bird, not modus tags, but they capture them, recapture them at like 50%, which is a lot. That's a lot of recapture, but they have found that with one project from, I think Ontario, that the birds are taking routes around very light polluted areas, like trying to stay in the dark areas, which makes a lot of sense. Um, other light pollution issues, there's really great content on the Fish and Wildlife Service website that I just looked at today. And it's called, um, you can just put in US FWS and say like bird collisions. And it'll there's a whole website that talks about treating your windows, um who in this room has ever had a bird fly into a window at their house or work before go ahead raise it up raise it up look around it's every single person every single time i give a talk and so folks are kind of shocked to hear that that's like the second largest human cause death of birds you know you see these birds go all this way it's so silly that they fly into a window like and you literally put stickers on the outside and it stops it's like the easiest cheapest thing we can do in mass for birds, it stops it immediately because they just see that it's not a pass through. So there's a lot of things you could do and that website talks about treating windows, but it also talks about light pollution, putting in like warmer, redder spectrum lights, um, just because that's not queuing in on birds and other insects thinking it's daylight because daylight is very blue part of the spectrum of light. So if you swap out your lights for a redder, warmer spectrum um, that affects them less, or you put top shades on your lights so that out in parking lots, you don't need lights pointing up. You don't need lights pointing out that far even if you try and make the point at the ground more. There's a lot of things that folks can do and lots of things online that you which, can- Which website was that again? It's the Fish and Wildlife Service. But oh. if you Google Fish and Wildlife Service bird collisions, um, they have a lot of great materials. They even have like low cost, they have a PDF that's all about like low cost solutions to, it's all very relatively cheap to do these things. And we can all do them like tomorrow. Like it's one thing we can all do very quickly. Whippoorwills, we're about to initiate a statewide project on them next spring and summer. Um, we're gonna start a PhD student. So I'm working with Frank Thompson with the Forest Service um, at the University of Missouri. He's with the Forest Service, but he's also a professor who's my thesis advisor. Um, and Tom Bono, who also works with the Fish and Wildlife Service, but he can take students at Mizzou. And we're gonna start a PhD student to put up uh, autonomous recording units, which are just little robots that are gonna replace all of us doing bird counts in the future. But you strap them onto trees and they record what's happening around. You can set them to turn on at night or the day. 
and we're going to monitor whippoorwills to figure out what habitat they are choosing in Missouri. So we're going to put them across a broad suite of woodland, savanna, different forest management practices like even age, uneven age um, across the whole state. So we're really going to try and figure out what whippoorwills like here for breeding. And then we can voice that to public and private land managers and be like, hey, whippoorwills are really declining. And you're right, they are declining. Um, yeah. If I had a nickel every time I heard someone say, you know what I used to hear when I was young? And I'd say, where were wells? Um, and yeah, it's just so important. And a lot of work on the wintering grounds going on too and tracking them using MODIS and other tracking um, to figure out where they're going down in Mexico predominantly. Um, so it's just really interesting. They're a really cool bird. Um, Sarah, do, do they make that horribly obnoxious sound down in Mexico? Actually, that's really interesting because they don't. <laughs> and so folks have um, folks from Illinois tagged birds. No, Illinois and Ohio tagged birds from across five states in the Midwest. So it's very Midwest specific, which I always like projects like that. And so they tagged birds across five states and they tracked where they went for the winter and they were using those cool GPS tags and then they recaptured about half the birds, which is pretty cool. And it's showing that they're going to a pretty specific part um, of Oaxaca and Chiapas in Mexico. And when they went down to the exact locations where the birds were detected that year, they would do whippoorwill playback and then they'd be like attacked by common paraques, which are different types of night jars. So then you're like, hmm, is this what happens when the whippoorwills vocalize down here? They just get attacked because it's like really competitive. So maybe that's their motivation to not say anything. So they don't. Um, but that would be a waste of energy on the wintering grounds, right? So talking to Paz, who is an amazing person, she's in Costa Rica. She's never heard a wood thrush sing. Oh, that crazy? Like, I know it makes sense. And I'm a bird biologist and I probably shouldn't think that that's crazy, but I couldn't believe that. That blew my mind. Like not once they sing the whole winter, but it makes sense. I mean, they're not defending territory. That's not what they're trying to do on the wintering grounds. They're just trying to eat and survive and hang out and they're on vacation. Um, but yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, There's a whole nother realm of study, right? Is like, yeah, they don't vocalize down there. And is that a survival tactic or they just don't need to? Great presentation. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Brett. I, uh, thanks, guys. I was fortunate to work with Brad Jacobs when I worked at the yeah. department, one of my favorite people there. So inspirational. Yeah. I always felt that that continental scale bird conservation was one of the most important things mm -hmm. MDC was involved in. And, um, as we, I would do research on that every once in a while, I would come across these stories of these, I'll call them outlier birds mm -hmm. that instead of migrating South, would accidentally, for whatever reason, migrate in the exact opposite direction. And every once in a while, it'd be a story of a bird that should be way down in South America where it's warm. And they're they're found up in Canada. It's getting yeah. cold. Some local zoo takes it in, feeds it over the winter, lets it loose again. And I was always so intrigued by those outliers. And I'm wondering if any of those outlier stories have percolated out of this data where you've looked at a screen and been like, what the heck is that little bird doing? Yes. And there. so that is tricky with MODIS because there's things called false positives. <laughs> so one issue, which none of these tracking technologies, PS are perfect, right? There's banding has its issues, geolocators, you have to recapture the bird. MODIS doesn't tell you exactly where the bird has gone and been. And so there's a drawback to all of them, but sometimes when the, these tags, they're working on the same frequency. So the thing that differentiates each tag across the frequency is its pulse rate, like how often it makes a pulse. And it's just the way the signal comes out is the unique identifier for that bird on that tag. And so if two are very similar, sometimes you can get false positives. And all that is up to the owners of the tag when they check the data to make sure. So they don't show any detection on the MODIS website that hasn't been three detections of that one tag within range of a station. So that already might be too harsh a filter, right? Some birds might fly really fast. You know, if they're, if their pulse rates 30 seconds, they're not going to, when they're booking it on migration, that bird isn't going to be detected within range of one station, right? If they're going fast. So all of that has to go into when you order the tags, how fast you want the pulse rate to be. But I haven't heard of too many anecdotal stories with MODIS finding those crazy outliers, but they are there. But with MODIS, it's hard to figure out whether it's a crazy outlier or a false positive. And so that's that's up to the researcher to make that uh, 
differentiation. And most of the researchers I talk to, they're very uh, conservative with that. They just, they won't just say, oh, this bird was crazy. And it went off a few states away and then came back. Like you can kind of parse that out. But yeah, there's a flamingo in Illinois right now. I mean, what? every single migration. I mean, that's the fun part about birding. If you have birded a lot is these rarities, right? That get blown off course during migration or they get caught in a storm, things like that. Yeah. We have one up here and then- Oh, okay. Corey. Okay. Corey. Yeah. Corey. Um, I was wondering, what does a bird have to do to get tagged? Be very unlucky. It's got to be real dumb and think that a playback is an actual bird and then come up to fight it and then get caught. But I'm trying to, what, what, what determines what birds you tag? So what species do you determine? Yeah. Who determines That's that? A really good question. Uh, so there's lists. Uh, I get list fatigue. There's a lot of lists. Priority bird lists is what I mean. So there's a, there's a list for the Fish and Wildlife Service. There's a list for Missouri that I help build. So that one's my fault. Uh, there's a Missouri list, a regional list. There's continental lists. There's lots of lists. And uh, what have gone into those are lots of time and effort by um, experts across these birds range that literally get on like Zoom calls and conference calls before there was Zoom um, to talk through each species and what they think the scores are for these birds, like one to five of how threatened it is by uh, population trend, by threats to them on their breeding grounds, threats to them on their wintering grounds. And they literally talk through all that tedium to assign scores. And then that weighs out in like the bigger the score, the more threatened the bird is. And they do that at many different scales. They do it across the hemisphere, regional, state. And so we pick species that are very threatened that we know we need to act on conservation wise. So all of this tracking, it's real fun and you get to go to neat places, but we're trying to make it inform land management on the ground. And that's such a huge chasm in the bird world is linking research to people doing something about it. It's such a big problem. And we need more people just talking to each other, practitioners talking to researchers. And so there's a big movement in the ornithological world. It's called co-production to bring in the state people and bring in the people who are doing management on the ground at the beginning of a project so that they feel buy-in. That's what we're trying to do with this wood thrush project is to get the people in the agencies that actually do the land management to help us all the way through it so that then they'll, they'll, they have ownership of that data and then they can voice that to their agencies or management folks to say, we really need to protect this forest for these birds that are moving through, things like that. Yeah. Good question. That was a good question. Yes, um, ma'am. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> We've been trying. We'll, we'll get to him. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. Um, I wonder about, so you've been relying on playbacks to capture the birds in the tropics. How many species are responding to playbacks given that they're not territorial? Yeah. And so are you mostly tracking like male wood thrush? Yeah. yeah. And then yeah. one other question. Yeah. So on the breeding grounds, are you going to focus more on females? Those are great questions that <laughs> only a bird bander would know. So <laughs> Paul's worked a really long time with the Missouri Ozark Forest Ecosystem Project, which has tagged birds since like 1991 and followed them around the Ozarks to look at forest management practices and their effect on breeding birds. So he knows, he knows it all. Those are really good questions. Um, the first one, are we mostly capturing males? Yes. Our goal was to capture males for this first round because they are a lot easier because they're all fired up. Um, and we've thought about that even with our brown headed nut hatches is did we just transport the feistiest ones that want to fight, right? Because they respond to the playback. They think it's another male in the territory, right? So the males usually fly up and they're like, I'm going to defend this. And then they get all confused and frustrated flying back and forth, trying to find the bird from the little speaker that they get caught in the net. And that's how we capture them. So yes, we have caught mostly males. We did, we did uh, tag maybe three or four females that we were able to capture, but they're a lot harder. The golden wings is what I'm talking about. Um, wood thrush, um, you can get at that by wing cord, I think, trying to differentiate male and female. Um, of course, we're on the wintering ground, so they don't have a brood patch. Um, or a cloacal protuberance, which is how you figure out if they're male, female on the breeding grounds. And so we're going to try and parse that out and we're going to try to get males and females, but it's just going to be hard with this many people tagging birds across. I think we'll just kind of get whatever birds people can trap, which we know will be mostly males, but for folks who know the difference and they can try to target net females. Yes, we do want both sexes. Yeah. Okay. We had a question over here. Oh, um, if you wanted to donate to MODIS, um, can you do it at a certain place? Can you, do you have an, 
info on that. Yeah. And then can you pick an area that you want? That was my other question. Can I pick an, can you pick an area? What? Yeah. So if you wanted to pick like Canada or Missouri or, yeah. you know, different state. I don't know about that on the MOTUS website, but they do take donations on the Birds Canada website. So it's MOTUS.org. It's called MOTUS because it means movement in Latin. That's just everybody asks at some point. Um, but you can donate right to the MOTUS project and that goes wherever they need it. I don't know that you can differentiate where you want it to go. Um, the Missouri Conservation Heritage Foundation takes donations for conservation projects in the state. And ever since we started in 2018, we have a Heritage Foundation account called Missouri Modus Project. We also have a, a Heritage Foundation account for the Wood Thrush Project as well. And so if, if people want to give uh, money to it's mochf.org, but that um, if you just put in the comments or you choose the designation you want, the Modus one should come up and there's a Wood Thrush one as well, if you were so inclined. Okay, I'm just going to remind people if you're headed back to Columbia tonight that uh, you will need to make, take a detour either <laughs> through Roachport over to Highway 40 or through the old Roachport gravel road. If you don't mind your car getting dirty over to Route J um, to get back on I-70. So heads up. Yeah. Oh, Kip has a question. Uh Everybody thought they were get to leave. Right. Uh, so, hey, can you tell us about Cafe Christina and oh the link to, right. You all thought you got to leave. No, so this is just the bird-friendly coffee that I was talking about. And so um, most of the coffee we buy in the store is sun coffee, which means land is cleared, forest is cleared. And it's like our corn and soybeans is a monoculture. There's no trees over top, right? And so shade coffee, which not all shade coffee is bird friendly. To be bird friendly, you need native trees making the shade over top of the coffee. And when coffee shrubs, which are about this tall, when coffee shrubs have shade, they grow slower, but they grow a better tasting coffee. Um, it's kind of like, um, well, it's not kind of like that, but it's with the, so all coffee was traditionally grown under shade trees until the 50s or 60s, which just blew my mind. I didn't know that. But farmers realized that if they remove the canopy, they could grow more coffee faster, but it's lower quality. And so um, most of the coffee we buy is sun coffee. Um, and so the shade coffee that's not bird friendly just puts up some shade trees over top that don't provide the insects that the birds need, but it's growing in shade. So it's a little better. Um, bird friendly coffee is a uh, certification program by the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Institute. And they have really strict uh, rules on the type of habitat on your coffee farm. The, the plants need to be grown in native shade, stuff like that. You can go online and find where to buy um, coffee that's bird friendly. Cafe Christina that Kip is talking about is uh, Finca Christina. Finca means farm. Finca Christina is uh, a coffee farm owned by Ernesto Carmen. You saw him in the pictures. He's a huge bird conservation um nerd no he's a bird conservationist and he does incredible work with selva that we just talked about we were tagging those golden wing warblers on his coffee farm on his parents coffee farm that he helps with and um it's a 26 acre coffee farm and i think their bird list is in yeah like two or three hundred and they have migrant birds all over in the coffee because it's grown under a canopy of native shade so the point is is that you're keeping that habitat for our migratory birds that go down there and the native birds right uh because you're not removing the habitat it's like growing together as opposed to habitat removal so cafe christina is a great option but i cannot promote any one brand and i mean not to promote any particular store, but I know for sure that Clover 